let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your wonderful kindness towards us and your boundless mercies that you have extended to all of us as your children. We pray as you have indicated and taught us to show respect, reverence to you because you are our father who art in heaven for hallowed is your name. So have mercy upon us, we pray this evening. We thank you that as fathers that we could give you all the thanks and the praise that is due to your name. And so we ask that you touch this platform today and every listener, particularly those who have been uh, struck with this scourge, this awful pandemic, those who are suffering, loved ones have been impacted and affected. We pray that you will bring healing to each one. Remember us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise be to God. It is indeed uh, an honor to serve you, to be your servant, and to share with you the word of God. Uh, today, the, the message that I'm going to share with you is titled, The Abomination and the Desolation in the Christian Church. And it fits into the theme and the broader context of where we are today in biblical history and in the chronology of the last day events. Our text of scripture is found in the book of Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, the words of Jesus when he spoke uh, on the Mount of Olives to his disciples as he prepared to depart and to return back to his father in heaven. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, Jesus says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Therefore, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken by spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. What a statement, what a, oh, what a prediction, what a pronouncement. You could try to find ways to describe what Jesus says and you will still fall short. You will still come short of proper, an adequate uh, verbiage to explain what Christ was saying to his disciples. Of course, he did not speak in English. He spoke the words in Aramaic and perhaps in Hebrew. But today we have it translated to us in English. And in the in English vernacular, as we looked at the word abomination and desolation, it does not ring like good news. It doesn't carry with it the flair of words that will bring comfort to the child of God. So now we as Christians living in the 21st century, reflecting and looking back at the Mount of Olive discourse, what Christ said to his disciples, we would say his farewell address, one verse seems to ring out and stand out among all what he said to his disciples. And I want to take the moment just to look at briefly what he said. Other versions of the Bible speaks about desolation or desolating sacrifice. The King James Version, along with several other translations, has the phrase, the abomination of desolation. We have seen many occasions that Jesus was talking symbolically, as he always does. He spoke in parables, and he always make reference to uh, prophecy. Symbolically, Jesus, when he spoke those words, 
he was referring to major events, both political and spiritual, that will take place in this world prior to the second coming. Before he departed, the disciples and other believers who were there with him were concerned about Jerusalem. They were concerned about the temple. They were concerned about the spiritual legacy of the nation of ancient Israel. So therefore, Jesus had to tell them and to break to them the news that something terrible was about to happen. He made this comparison according to Luke in Luke chapter 21, verse 20. He drew their attention to the destruction of Jerusalem. He compared it to abomination of desolation. And then he made reference to Daniel, pointing back to the prophecies of Daniel, the words of Daniel, because Jesus was a student of the scriptures. And then he encouraged his disciples, his followers, to pay attention to what Daniel had prophesied. Now, you know, all the, the, uh, the Old Testament prophets, they all prophesied concerning Jesus. Jesus told um, the Pharisees and the scribes in John 5, uh, 46, he says, had he believed Moses, he would have also believed me because he wrote of me. But if he believed not his writings, how shall then he believe my words? You see, because Moses was the most prolific writer in the Old Testament. He wrote the Pentateuch uh, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. And so therefore, when the Jewish scholars and teachers and the rabbis, when they spoke of the Torah, they are referring to predominantly the writings of Moses. And so Jesus now is making reference to not only the Torah, but he's making reference to the book of Daniel. Because Daniel in particular spoke of and gave evidence of the children of Israel when they went into captivity in Babylon. And so the experience they had when they were taken to Babylon was one that they had vowed never to forget. As a result of their uh, exiled, the temple in Jerusalem was left in disrepair. It was left desolate because there was a desecration made to the temple. And so after the, um, the period of, of um, the, the time they spent in Babylon, there was a decree that was sent out to reconstruct and to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and the worship. So after the exile, there was a repatriation of going back, a Zionist movement to go back to Jerusalem and to resettle in the Holy Land. So Jesus knew that the, uh, the, the believers were concerned about the future of the, te the temple, the city, and of course the religion. So Christ made mention of something that arrest their attention. So we're going to look at the abomination of desolation as was prophesied by Daniel regarding to something that will occur in the future for the children of Israel. Firstly, let us take a closer look at other passages of scripture, particularly what is written in the book of Daniel. Firstly, Jesus showed us that the abomination of desolation had already been foretold by Daniel the prophet. Yes, indeed, it had already been foretold by Daniel the prophet. You will find this in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. Secondly, when Daniel spoke of it, the abomination of desolation, in chapter 9, verse 27, in particular, chapter 9, verse 27, you could take notation of that. You could write it down. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel called the abomination of desolation. He says, the abomination that makes desolate. Very interesting. The abomination that makes desolate. He predicted that it would cause the sanctuary and the host to be trampled on the foot. You'll find this in Daniel chapter 24, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 
through 27. So now it, it, it really um, demands our attention. It demands our attention to take a closer look at the meaning of the word abomination as it relates to transgression. Now, in the Old Testament, the word abomination is sometimes used for idol worship. You will find this in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 13. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 13, as well as Isaiah chapter 44, verse 19. So those two passages links and connects abomination to idol worship. On the other hand, the word transgression refers to something sinful or irreverent. Therefore, the sacrilege, the sacrilege caused by transgression in Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 through 27 and the abomination of desolation spoken by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 verse 15 are intertwined, interconnected. They are one and the same. They both have spiritual as well as political implications. First, the political act that produced sinful transgression or abomination also caused the abomination, also caused the desolation. Let me repeat this. The political act that produced sinful transgression also caused the desolation. So the desolation means to leave something in a state of disrepair. In other words, to stop or to cause a cessation of spiritual practices or spirituality. Because if there is no ritual going on in the temple, because the temple is in a state of disrepair, it will impact the spiritual standing of the people or the worshipers. So they are all connected. And what will cause the desolation is a political intervention, just as when um, Nebuchadnezzar went into Jerusalem and took captive the children of Israel, including the priests and the sons of the, um, the princes, and had caused the sacrifices and the oblation to cease from functioning, and the priests ceased from functioning and offering the sacrifices. Therefore, it was in a state of desolation. So each time this happens, each time the temple services stop, it creates a, 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 a desolation. And the desolation now opens the road for spiritual declension. All right? Now, any system, political or religious, that would cause the services of God to come to a stop, a cessation, would be guilty of committing a sacrilegious act. In other words, it will cause or enable a stumbling or on the foot the services of God. And so when Daniel made reference to that, he is directly talking about how it will impact the temple and its services. So in other words, it was a sinful system of worship that would call, according to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, it would be a sinful system of worship that would commit, that will be committed or that will cause the sacrilege of trampling on the foot and cause a desolation of God's holy city, Jerusalem. Therefore, Jerusalem, the ancient city, is today a sim symbol of another city. That is the city of God in heaven. And we're going to touch that a little bit. The sanctuary that was on earth or the temple that was on earth no longer functions. No longer functions. And so therefore, Jesus is trying to turn our attention 
to the real temple, the one that the earthly temple represented, and the one that we are called by Christ to focus our attention it to is the one that deserves our attention. We're going to see how this works. First, the meaning behind um, what happened to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman Empire in AD 70. First AD 66, the armies of Rome came and they surrounded the city. And then there was a partial or temporary withdrawal from the, the city until something went on terribly wrong. And on the Titus, the general, they went back and sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple and the worshipers. And it became, it brought an end to the temple service and the sacrifices that were being offered on the altar on a continuous ceaseless continuous basis until there were no more. Everything came to a cessation. So it is important that we understand both the political and the spiritual implications. Now we need to look at the Roman army and how they went about bringing destruction to the temple in AD 17. We are told by historians that when the ancient Roman soldiers conquered Jerusalem, they carried standards or banners. These were long poles which each legion hung its characteristic symbols on them. The legions, the Roman legions that fought against Jerusalem AD 70 carried the standard banner and on the standard banner was written 10th Fratinus, 10th Fratinist, and 12th Fulminata, 12th Fulminata, and 10th Fratinist. Now, the root word for Fratinitus, F R E T N I S S I S, is Fret, F R E T, meaning C in Latin. The adjective is fretus, F-R-E-T-U-S, fretus, meaning supported by C. Now, what does all of that have to do with the destruction of Jerusalem? We're going to see. The root word for fulminata, fulminata, fulminata is fulmin, fulmin, meaning crushing blow crushing blow. The adjective is fulminitas, meaning destructive of lightning. Now, all of this sums up to, and to, to this day, there is a term known as the Illuminati. The Illuminati carries the same symbol that was derived, that is derived from the Roman standard banner. Very interesting. Now, as you follow with me, it is important to note that when the Romans destroyed the city, they plant the banner so that those whom they conquered would know that the conquest was achieved through their gods, through their gods, through their, the powers of their pagan gods. The ancient writer Tertullian, Tertullian, the ancient writer, asserts that the camp region, re, religion, the camp religion of the Romans is all through a worship of the standards. That is found in Tertullian Apology, number 16, chapter 16, uh, number 16, chapter 331. According to another ancient historian, one by the name of Josephus, a Jewish historian, Josephus, a Jewish historian, says 
that the Romans carried their standards to the temple court in Jerusalem and set them up opposite the eastern gate. There they sacrificed their offerings to them, according to the historian Josephus. Now that seems to coincide with a prophecy that was given by Ezekiel in chapter 8 verse 16, when Ezekiel prophesied that um, some men will stand in front of the temple with the eight, eight, their faces towards the east and they will offer sacrifices to the sun god, the god of the sun. And of course, the Romans were known to be sun worshippers. Sun worshippers. It, it is all well known, written in all the ancient documents, that the Romans were sun worshippers. Now, the action of the ancient Roman Empire replicated the action of people of spiritual Rome today. And we will see how this plays out. The Roman army stood in the holy place and destroyed and made desolate Jer the Jerusalem temple in AD 70. They literally stood in the holy place and destroyed and made desolate the services in the temple. To this day, there have not been any services in the temple in Jerusalem. So to the Jews, it was abomination. So it was an abomination, one, because of the idolatrous, because of what they brought in, they planted their standard the flag, which was a symbol of idolatry and paganism. So paganism corrupted and desecrated and produced desolation for literal Jews in the year AD 70. That was phase number one. caused by ancient Rome. It was a political blow caused by lightning. And light, that lightning was a symbol of the, the, the light of the sun. Now let's go to phase two. Phase two, papal Rome through the teachings of the church of Rome because they, the church of Rome came from pagan Rome, papal came from pagan. So when papal Rome came on the scene, they started to practice and to incorporate teachings that also contributed to the further desecration of the holy place as was observed by the prophets. Therefore, according to the words of Jesus, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now we have to understand because the fulfillment of the words of Jesus causes us to look further and to look more critically to the events that have taken place throughout the history of the Christian church. Now, according to the Hebrew Talmud, the Hebrew Talmud, Ministry, the ministry of Jesus uh, in the heavenly sanctuary. Um, I'm sorry, according to the, uh, the Hebrew Talmud, the ministry in the earthly sanctuary was it was it had come to a cessation. But according to modern Christian teachings, not only did it come to an end because of what Rome did but it shifted from Jerusalem to Rome. Shifted from Jerusalem to Rome. So what has happened in Rome is a replacement of what happened in Jerusalem. Now let's take a closer look. Because there is a connection between the holy place and the host of heaven. The holy place could not be referred to the earthly sanctuary because during the time of papal Rome, pagan Rome had already destroyed the earthly temple. The host of people who worshipped in it could not have been literal Jews or modern day Jews. Why? Because spiritual Jews, modern day has spiritual Jews 
has been replaced by modern day Christianity. Because the, um, the apostle Paul says, if he be Christ, if he be Christ, Galatians chapter three, verse 29, then he are Abraham's seed and is according to the promise. So everyone who accepts Jesus Christ spiritually become Jews. We are children of Abraham. Abraham was the first Jew. Remember that. Abraham was the first Jew. And therefore, by virtue of being grafted into the, the, uh, the, the, the brotherhood of the nation of Israel through Jesus Christ, we are now spiritual Israel. But what has happened to modern-day Christianity is of tremendous interest because modern-day Christianity is spearheaded by the, by the central teachings that, are come, that has been coming from the Church of Rome. So the teachings of people Rome have in many ways corrupted those whom Jesus says stand in the holy place. Bible students, therefore, need to re-examine what is meant when Jesus says, stand in the holy place. Now, let us look at what happens or what stands out in the holy place, in the earthly sanctuary, in the first place. In the earthly sanctuary, the holy place, remember there were two apartments, two apartments, the holy and the most holy. Jesus says, whosoever understand, whosoever readeth, let him understand and therefore stand in the holy place. So therefore, let us look at the contents of the holy place in order to have a semblance of understanding as to what kind of activity that would impact the holy place. So in the holy place, we have there was the table of showbread, number one, the table of showbread. Number two, the altar of incense. And number three, the seven golden candlesticks. These were the three items that you would find in the holy place. Jesus made direct reference to the holy place. So therefore, we must pay attention to those three items. That's obvious. It's obvious. So how would now, how would the modern day system of Christianity pollute, corrupt, or make desolate the holy place just as the ancient Roman Empire made desolate the holy place? First, modern day Christianity under the papal church during the Middle Ages, changed the Lord's Supper, which represents the shoe bread, because the shoe bread means bread without leaven. Okay, that shoe bread, the bread without leaven, represent the body of Jesus Christ, which was offered for our sins on Calvary. Remember what Jesus says. He said, I am the bread that came from heaven. And remember the night of the Last Supper, he told his disciples, whosoever eateth of this bread shall hunger no more. He referred to himself as the bread from heaven. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So spiritually, the showbread represents the body of Jesus Christ. And the, that's where we find the significance of the desecration of whom Jesus, whom the bread represents. And therefore, what the middle-aged church did was to desecrate the content of the holy place by first replacing the shoe bread. With what? With what? They replaced the shoe bread by corrupting the communion service of the Lord. So in other words, 
the communion service no longer is what it's supposed to sh or should have been in the first place, they have introduced what is called transubstantiation or the mass. That's right, the mass or transubstantiation, they have now instituted in the place of what Christ established with his disciples a, a, a shoe bread that does not represent who Jesus is. We will come back to this in a while. Secondly, secondly, the spiritual bread also represents the word of God. They, the church of the Middle Ages, replaced the word of God with religious traditions. They have placed human tradition above the word of God. So the Bible, the word of God, no longer stands pre predominant or, uh, or, or stands as the undiluted, inspired word of God, but they have made the Bible secondary to human tradition. That is another form of polluting the holy place because we find those items were found there symbolically represented by the table of showbread. Fourth, the lampstand, and or, um, before we go to the lampstand, we find the, the incense, the altar of incense. The altar of incense represents the ministry of Jesus Christ as our heavenly high priest. Jesus was no longer considered or pointed to as our heavenly high priest, but was replaced with earthly priests, replaced with earthly priests, and no longer are no longer were people required to go to Jesus to confess their sins. Remember what the Bible says: the Word of God says we we have to come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy come and refuge in time of need. It says that we should confess our sins to God. He is faithful and just. That's what the Bible says. God is faithful and just. To forgive us from all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The church of the Middle Ages says you don't have to go to Jesus. You can go to earthly priests, confess your sins to them instead of confessing your sins to the Heavenly Father. That is another form of polluting the holy place. Because in the holy place, we find the altar of incense, which represents the ministry of Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners. The number four. For the lampstand had seven branches, seven branches in the lampstand, which represents the Holy Spirit giving light. And number seven refers to perfection, which means, therefore, the Bible says, Thy word, Psalm 105, 119, 105, thy, David says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So, therefore, when we follow the direction and instructions of the Holy Spirit, we will not be led into false teachings. We will walk in truth. Number seven denotes perfection. And the lampstand with seven branches represents not only the Holy Spirit giving light on a continuous basis, but it also points us to the seventh day Sabbath, which was replaced by the church of the Middle Ages with Sunday worship. So let us look at this very carefully. To desecrate the holy place that Jesus says, whosoever readeth, let him understand. The holy place was desecrated on three levels. Number one, the table of shoe bread, which represents the Lord's body, which Jesus inaugurated the day before he was crucified when he established the first communion service, was replaced with the daily mass by the church of the Middle Ages. Number two, the altar of incense was replaced with the ministry of earthly priests rather than that of our heavenly high priest, which is Jesus Christ. And then the, se the gold seven golden candlesticks was also polluted because of the change of the Sabbath. And therefore, the, the people 
we're no longer walking in the light, light of the truth, but in human tradition. So the table of true bread was desecrated. The altar of incense was desecrated. And the seven golden candlesticks were also desecrated. And you find those three items in the holy place. And so therefore, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Symbolically, spiritually, when we focus our attention to what has happened to the sanctuary, then we begin to understand the significance and the, uh, of the church of the Middle Ages, what she has done in replacing what was uh, in the holy place. Now, it is important to note as well that modern day Christianity, present day Christianity, follows in the footsteps of the Middle Ages. The, 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 the church of the Middle Ages, which was dominated to, even to this day by the papacy or papal Rome. Now, number one, I'm going to share with you at least four more points, which is very important. Point number one, modern day Christianity do not practice the Lord's Supper in the correct way. For those of you who are listening, I want you to know that because the way the Lord inaugurated he, the Last Supper was first, he, he washed his disciples' feet. After he washed his disciples' feet, then he broke the bread, gave them to eat the bread, and he says, this is the uh, my body which was broken for you. And then he gave them the wine to drink. Modern day Christianity does not follow this example. Number one, the bread that they use at the communion service is not unleavened bread or the kind of show bread that was in, um, placed in the holy place. Uh, the, 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 the bread must be without leaven, without yeast, without salt or any other ingredient. It must be pure, unleavened bread because leaven or yeast represent sin. Because that the, if the bread has to represent the body of Jesus Christ and there was no sin in Christ, therefore that bread must be on living or show bread to show. It had to show, be present in the temple. God must be present in the human temple. That's why the bread was called the bread of the presence. So now when we practice the communion so it's the correct way, then God's presence will be with us. Hallelujah. Now, it is important to note that modern day Christianity are following after tradition, not after according to scripture. Number one, a lot of them are using wine that is that contains alcohol rather than, than the, the unfermented or unalcoholic wine. Alcohol, again, is a sign or, or represents sin. So there must not be any alcohol in the wine. It must be pure grape juice. Just as the bread had to be without leaven, the wine must be without fermentation or alcohol. In fact, in fact fermentation is a sign of decay. When the wine decays, it ferments, it decomposes into a new chemical compound. Therefore, the alcohol is a sign of decay. The body of Jesus Christ did not experience decay. The body of Jesus Christ did not experience decay. So alcohol, which is decay, a decay state of the wine, cannot be the one used at communion service to represent the spilt blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So now modern day Christianity has corrupted the holy place by using a false wine and a false bread on a false day. Number two, the modern day Christianity have allowed, they have allowed pagan practices to enter the Christian church and have incorporated them in an effort to help promote the falsehood of, of, of false spirituality. And what is that false spirituality? The false spirituality is that they do not believe in the heavenly sanctuary and do not teach about Christ's ministry on behalf of sinners in heaven. Let us read from the word of God. Let me read Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1. 
Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, the word of God says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. For we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true, the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So anything that was done on earth was a symbol. It was not the real. The real is what the Apostle Paul on the divine inspiration tells us. Heaven, what God himself pitched and not man. So which means that as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, our attention all of Christianity, our attention should be directed to heaven. What is going on in heaven right now? The Apostle Paul says, Christ is the minister of the true tabernacle in heaven. How could we miss that? How could modern Christianity miss that? And I'll tell you why they miss this. They miss this because the attention is not in heaven. The attention is on earth. Instead of focusing on our heavenly high priest, we have earthly priest, instead of focusing on what Christ is doing on behalf of sinners right now, we are focusing more on human clergy, human clerical authority and role and what they are doing right now. Everything has, Jesus Christ has literally been eclipsed from view. In fact, modern day Christians, instead of they call Christianity by its right name, the Bible says those who at the early first century period, they were called Christians because they followed Christ. They did everything Christ asked them to do. But today, churches are named and people and leaders are naming ministry after themselves. They are using human names to name their ministry as opposed to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the focus now is not on Jesus, but upon human greatness, human achievement, human powers. That is very unfortunate. Four, number four, they do not acknowledge the seventh day Sabbath, but instead they embrace the first day of the week, which was a pagan festival, a pagan day of worship, Sunday, the first day of the week. They do not rely on the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. They talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. They talk about the anointing, but they do not have the true oil of anointing. And I'll tell you why, because the lampstand well, with the seven golden candlestick lampstand represent the Holy Spirit where the oil was ne never run out. It was poured in on a continuous basis. Therefore, we cannot have God partially. We must have his presence fully with us. Enabling us to walk not, in part, not partly in the truth, but fully in the truth. You cannot have God and believe half of the scriptures. You cannot have God and believe uh, uh, what you want, pick and choose whatever ministry you want. Either all of Christ or none of him at all. And so therefore, for modern day Christianity to believe that they are following Christ, but yet still they are rejecting the Sabbath which Christ observed and kept and the disciples kept. Rather, rather they are now embracing or have embraced Sunday, which is based on human tradition, they are not fully led by the Holy Spirit in doing that which is contrary to the word of God. So now Jesus is asking us to stand in the holy place. In other words, to practice the things contained in it. That's how we could stand in the holy place. By practicing the things that contained in the holy place. Now let me give you some historical data on some men who, at least when they stood for truth, they stood in the holy place, they were persecuted, they were beheaded, they were killed, they were burned alive because they stood up for truth. And Christ is telling us that we need to stand in the holy place. In, seven, in 1374, seven, uh, 1374, an arch deacon 
at the Cathedral of Prague. One Malik at the Cathedral of Prague turned down a promotion and resigned his position. Why? Because he believed that the papal authority represented the Antichrist. In 1384, John Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, the well-known Catholic churchman and Orthodox professor, saw the abomination of desolation in the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is the mass that has substituted the Lord's Supper. He said that, and we know what happened to John Wycliffe. Oh yes, he was persecuted by the church for making that connection. In 1417, 1417, Sir John Oldcastle, after Wycliffe's death, refused to stop preaching concerning the Lord's Supper, the proper way in which the communion service ought to be uh, um, celebrated. He knew the scripture and said that the Pope represents the son of perdition that or the man of lawlessness, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm telling you what has been documented as historical facts. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, he connected the papacy with the abomination that is that has caused desolation. And he says the desolation of the abomination is that the Church of Rome has caused people to turn away their attention from Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary and are now focusing on earthly human ministry rather than on Christ's heavenly ministry. Hence the reason why you should not be surprised why there are so much effort on, on behalf of clergy to not to preach the sanctuary message. There is something about that. Sir John Oldcastle, who followed after John Wycliffe, he was thrown in prison and later sentenced to be barbecued or to be burned alive. And while he was slowly being burned alive, he died singing, praise, giving praises to God. Others followed in their footsteps. In 1415, John Huss, in 1415, a Bohemian like Melek, also identified the papacy of Rome with the man of sin. Huss means goose. <laughs> Very interesting. The name Huss, Huss means goose. In Bohemian, the name Huss means goose in Bohemian. He was aware that his goose might have get cooked. It did. On July 6, 1415, the bishops of the Ecclesiastical Council of Constance had him burned alive. Following John Huss, in 1546, Martin Luther, a monk, he came to see that the church of his time as the abomination which Jesus speaks about in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, and in 2 Thessalonians, Martin Luther connect, make the connection. And he says that the papacy and the man who sits on the throne of Rome, who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So therefore, desecrating uh, the name of God and also the position of God. He is given credit, Martin Luther, for fanning the flame of the Protestant Reformation. Today, are we like them still protesting, proclaiming the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, pointing people to stand in the holy place? Or have we turned our backs like the men that Ezekiel saw with our faces to the east, worshiping the sun instead of the living God? So my dear friends, today the appeal is in which steps are you following? Is modern Christianity following in the steps of convenience, the steps of human tradition, 
or are we following in the steps of the Holy Scriptures whereby we are receiving the constant light that shines from the holy place represented by the seven golden candlesticks which denotes the seventh day Sabbath and also the true ministry of Jesus Christ, the altar of incense as he ministers on our behalf according to Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 and 2 as our true high priest, true minister in the true tabernacle, in the true temple which God himself preached and not preach and not men. My dear friends, may God open our eyes to see and to understand. Jesus says, he that readeth, let him understand. Praise God, Pastor. Indeed, I truly appreciate uh, that clear biblical information that you are sharing with us in time with prophecy and also um, history, recent history that confirm uh, the teaching of Jesus Christ and confirm uh, the prophecy as it fulfilled then and some of them are still being fulfilling even now as we speak. I want to I want to send to my 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 question around these three essential principles that you share with us: uh, the table, the altar, and also the gold, the seven golden candlestick. Uh, in the simplest manner, explain for me, please, the 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 table. Uh, uh, what does a table represent and the shoe bread and communion, etc.? Yeah, well, first of all, keep it in mind, keep it in mind that when the Roman soldiers in 8070 invaded Jerusalem, sacked the temple, the ministry in the holy place came to a cessation. Not only was the ministry in the holy place came to a cessation, but it was desecrated. And religiously, whenever services come to an end, that is considered to be an abomination because not, that's not supposed to happen. But it did. And so when we look at the holy place and the cessation that took place, the question must be asked, what was involved in that first apartment? What was involved in that first apartment requires us to understand the meaning and the significance behind the three distinct separate pieces of furniture that, that was placed in the holy place. Number one, the table of the shoe bread. Number two, the altar of incense. And number three, the seven golden candlesticks. Each of them had a specific meaning and reference to the work of Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus said, he is the bread that came down from heaven. The shoe bread represents his, himself because the shoe bread means the, the bread without leaven, unleavened bread. And when he instituted the communion service, he changed the order. Remember that. Prior to the communion service that Christ inaugurated with his disciples, they were offering the old um, sacrifice of the lamb. Christ replaced the lamb with himself when he died on the cross. So now Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. John the Baptist put as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And then the, he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Whosoever eateth of this bread shall never hunger again. So Christ now has replaced that. So now what, what has happened in the Middle Ages is that the Catholic Church together with all the other churches that followed in the footsteps of the Catholic Church, they are now practicing practicing the a wrong communion service by what you call transubstantiation. In other words, they do not um, partake of unleavened bread and unfermented wine, which Christ did. They have a bread that is made up of, uh, that has others, it's bleach. It is not the whole wheat, it's bleach. And anything that is bleach, you have taken away the, the, the original ingredients out of it, etc. And also, most of them contain salt, which is not supposed to be. Now, also, in addition to that, you know, when you look at the Catholic Mass on Sunday, the Mass, uh, they are saying that they are substitute, literal substitution of the bread into the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, we know the bread is a symbol, not the real one. It is a symbol. So in other words, you and God did not call us to become cannibals to eat flesh, real flesh and real blood. He says we are to eat it as a symbol in remembrance. Paul says in Corinthians. Now, we go to the altar of incense. 
what has happened with the incense. The incense, uh, John talked about it a lot in Revelation. Our prayers has to ascend to God as incense. And who are we supposed to pray to when we pray? Jesus Christ, our Savior. But instead, today, uh, modern Christianity, through the leadership of papal Rome, has instituted earthly priests. And earthly priests now has taken the position of Jesus Christ, and people are now relying more on human clergy rather than Jesus Christ, the real clergy, which Paul in Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 says, is our heavenly high priest. And if Christ is our heavenly high priest, where is he ministering? He is ministering in heaven. And if he is ministering in heaven, and Paul says, of in the true tabernacle. How, how could Christianity miss that? In the true tabernacle. Therefore, our focus and our attention must turn to the heavenly sanctuary. And num number three, the third piece of furniture, which is the seven golden candlesticks. You know, John in Revelation says he saw Jesus walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That is very significant. The number seven denotes perfection. And God will not create number seven and then decide to change it to something that does not represent perfection. Number seven represents perfection. Number one does not represent, the, the first day of the week does not represent perfection. The Sabbath, the seventh day of the week represents perfection. Why does the seventh day of the week represent perfection? Because Jesus says the Sabbath is my holy day. So if God says he's, the Sabbath is his holy day and God is perfect, Therefore, the Sabbath is a symbol of perfection. Praise but God. Today, modern Christianity has polluted the Sabbath. The seven-day Sabbath has been polluted with the first day of the week. The ministry of Jesus Christ has been polluted with earthly, priestly ministry. And the table of shoe bread have been polluted with the false communion service. Indeed, indeed. You know, while, while I could go on and enter into a dialogue with you for the next hour and a half. Uh, in the interest of time, I want to pause. Is there a question or a statement from someone in the audience? Any question or statement? Is there a question or statement? You know, it appears as if you, you've done such a great job in explaining to us uh, that there's no question and, and there is no statement. So uh, we have approximately three minutes um, for this question that I'm, I'm going to ask. Given what we're seeing here now, clearly, uh, the, these three things in a holy place that represent Jesus Christ, you know, it, it, called, it made clear to me um, the, the motto of this show, that Jesus is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world, the redeemer of the world, and that he's coming back as king of kings and lord, and lord of lord of lords. And what I saw clearly, Pastor, from what you have presented to us in terms of the abomination of the holy place is that Jesus being the, the way, the only means upon which salvation is possible. This abomination corrupt the very processes that Jesus has set in place that point to him that salvation only exists through him. Is this a fair assessment of what you just shared with us? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right on point, Pastor Bonaby. You know, and our listening audience, I'm so glad that they're listening to this presentation today. And uh, I want to encourage everyone not to be embarrassed nor ashamed to embrace and to advocate the ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Because it is real. The Bible clearly establish this as an unadulterated truth. Now, what is happening now, Pastor Bonaby, is that Christianity has become popularized. And the popularity of Christianity 
is that in in the in the quest to embrace circular people, people in the world, they have dismissed some of the key cardinal points that present Jesus Christ as our only advocate, our mediator, our heavenly high priest, our intercessor, our sin forgiving savior. And so therefore, what happened to ancient Jerusalem by the ancient Roman Empire is being reenacted in a spiritual sense by modern Christianity. And modern Christianity consists not only of Rome, papal Rome that is, but of all the religious, all the Christian religious institutions that follows in the practice of papal teachings. So if you are a modern Christian and you are observing Sunday, you are not following the principles of the Bible. You are following human tradition. If you are exalting human teaching above that of Jesus Christ, you are not following the Bible. You are following modern tradition. And modern tradition has now replaced the scriptures. So doing that is an abomination. Replacing the Bible with human tradition, that is an abomination. Replacing Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary with human ministry on earth, that is an abomination. Because human beings did not die to save us from sin. Christ did. Uh, replacing the seventh-day Sabbath with the first day of the week does not represent the seven golden candlestick in the holy place. This is an abomination. So all of these points directly to the prophecy of Jesus, Matthew 24, 15. And Christ is telling us, whosoever readeth, let him understand.